you see that? No, not that. That. That is snow. Yes, we got snow in Albuquerque. The first moisture we've had all winter season. Not much snow, just a dusting, but it's pretty cold out there this morning, relatively speaking. No, it's not Minnesota, but anyways, it's gonna be a cold winter day, so what do we do? Let's build a pinhole camera. Well, it's not super cold out there. It's only about 23 degrees Fahrenheit, but not too bad. Hey, welcome to the channel, everybody. Um, so I thought for a good little winter's day project, I thought we would uh, look about making a pinhole camera. Now, I don't need another pinhole camera in my life. I have a whole bin full of pinhole cameras that I'm not using that I've built over the years. But I thought it would be a good opportunity to show you guys how I go about to the process of making and designing a pinhole camera. And this particular camera is going to be based on a box that I found. So I was cleaning out my office about a week or two ago, and I came across this box for a Galaxy S7 phone. And I noticed one thing about it, several things about it. First of all, there's an outer slip cover that kind of comes off the box. And then uh, I noticed that the way it opens, okay, it has this little flap, this tab that goes in a slot. And then I noticed that the inside of this box is, I would say, light tight. Uh, we'll have to test it, of course, to be sure, but it's a light tight box. And it looks like you could put photo paper in the back of the box. And then when you put the lid over it, it seals up the back edge and it looks like it seals up the front edge pretty good. And the only real concern is going to be the two sides here, these two little gaps in here, which we're going to have to worry about. And then, of course, that whole thing slips into the slip case. And so I thought, hey, with just a little bit of modification, this might make a pretty good pinhole camera. Let's see how we can do it. So before I get into the materials and supplies I'm going to need for the project, let me state that uh, I'm doing this project real time. I have not built this yet, and I've never built a camera out of a, the packaging box of a cell phone, so this is totally new to me. But this is what I anticipate I'm going to need. So the most important material you're going to need is black gaffer's tape. Uh, this is inch wide, and this is the ProGaff brand, and I buy this gaffer's tape from my local film industry supply house field and frame no sponsorship but i just wanted to mention them and also since i reach behind here another of course thing you'll need is scissors to make the pinhole this is a roll of two mil that's 0.002 inch thick sheet brass very thin sheet brass and uh, i'll be cutting a little square of that and then i'm going to be using a sewing needle stuck into a wine cork and 600 grit emery paper and Another accessory that comes in handy when you're building these projects is this chipboard. It's thin cardboard, and I get it at my craft store. I think Michael's in my neighborhood has it. And I have a bunch of scraps of this chipboard that I save from different projects. I'm going to be using that. Probably, most likely, there's two reasons I'll be using the cardboard. One of those is as a backing for poking the hole uh, with the needle into the brass for the pinhole. But the other reason is I want to build a sliding shutter, on some kind of a shutter mechanism on the front of this, and I'm going to probably use some cardboard for that. But the big thing design-wise that we need to, to, to take care of in this, in this design is the two little gaps up here on this side and that side where light can come in. And even with the slip cover put into place, uh, you're still going to have a corner here and a corner here where light can come in at an angle and fog the paper. So we're going to have to make some little light baffles in order to make this lid secure. Now, there are several ways of doing it. What we could, one idea would be to um, take some thin pieces of black construction paper, which is not on my list, but we'll get some. Take some black construction paper and make some little covers on the corner here, like here and here, or even a whole strip of it along the sides here. And then when you close it down, those act like internal baffles. And that would be a really simple solution. The problem with it is that in a changing bag, trying to get photo paper in and out of this box with the edges being partly covered is going to be problematic. It's going to make it difficult to get paper in and out without 
tearing this, these little baffles or having them in the way of our photo paper when you're working blind by hand. Actually, you know what? There is an insert I just noticed. Ooh, that makes it even better. We might actually take advantage of this insert and uh, we could probably just stick the photo paper on the insert with a piece of, uh, with a loop of, of uh, craft tape and then just slip the insert in. That's perfect. That solves that problem. So getting the paper negative in and out will be no problem then. And then uh, the pinhole is going to be mounted into a hole on the inside of the lid right here. And then we're going to have to have a corresponding larger hole on the slip cover that will, the slip cover will have a sliding shutter and that'll be our shutter. And the, the pinhole box will be sitting like that. Okay, so I spent a little bit of time thinking a little bit further about how we're going to implement the little light seals along the side edges of the box here. And I decided if I have any kind of a flap system that's secured to the lid, the lid has to fold out like this and up. And it means that the flap has to bend and it reflects, and that's not going to be very good. So I've decided what we're going to do is build a couple little slips that slip onto either end of this, and then the whole sleeve slips on. And that hopefully should make it light tight and also still make it um, relatively easy to load and unload by hand in a changing bag. So what I've done is I've kind of uh, got some black craft paper and I uh, traced out the size of the end of this and I simply made a little pattern with some uh, pencil marks uh, pressing hard enough on the on the paper that I can use the creases to fold with. And so the inner rectangle is the actual size of the end of the side of the box. I'm using a three quarter inch overlap. And so what I did is I simply split each of these little folds right here. And now what I'm able to do is, if I'm using the box here as a template to show you, so you're just gonna fold down each of these flaps and we're going to tape with gaffer's tape the flaps like that to make a secure little slip cover for each end. Now one of the concerns about this is that uh, you again, when you have this split right here, when you fold it like that, you might actually have a light leak through the little pinhole gap in the corner there. So I'm going to show you how to use gaffer's tape to tape it up so that you don't have any kind of a, of a hole there. Okay, so what I've done is I've taped up the flaps, folded and taped them. So basically, the little slip cover is taped up, but there's still some concern whether the corners are light tight or not because the tape isn't actually right on the corner. So let me show you how I do that. But before I do that, let me just show you the slip cover slips over the top, uh, the short end, and there'll be in the short side, and there'll be another one on this side. And then the the main slip case slips in like that, and that should provide us our light tight integrity on those gaps. Okay, so let me show you how I'm gonna apply the tape to the corner, to the actual very vertex of the corner to make it light tight. So I've cut a, a square of tape, it's an inch square. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna apply it to the corner so that the center of the square is right where the vertex is at. So you can kind of see it's like that, roughly. It's all approximate, it's not exactly in the center, but it's pretty close, right? Okay, so... I'm going to fold it over one direction like that. What I want to do on the other side here is I want to create a little ridge and I want to kind of push it down like that. And then we're going to fold this flap down and tape it. Okay, so I have the one flap end cap, I guess you call it, done. And I've only secured these two uh, corners with our little squares of tape. I didn't do the back side. And the reason why is I don't want to add too much tape uh, because the slip cover has to fit over it. And if you get it too bulky, it just won't go in, especially considering we still have to do the bottom side here. So um, when the slip cover is going to have a preferential direction, it goes on in this direction, covering up the part of the box that's open right from the slip cover. The back side, the back corners, we're going to assume are going to be light tight because they're going to already be inside the slip cover here, which we're going to tape up later on. Okay, so I've uh, laid out the uh, rest of the pattern for the other end of the camera box, so to the bottom of it, like that, and I have three quarter inch 
borders around the end of the box so I can fold those as my three quarter inch deep flaps. And I'm gonna go ahead and cut this out and fold it and tape it up. Okay, so the uh, slip cover is back in place. I have my two little end cap covers installed. Uh, this first one I made is a little bit uh, snug, or actually a little bit loose. Anyways, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to cover up the two gaps in the outer slip cover box. So I've already put a piece of tape over the top ridge. I've taped up this corner. I'm going to do this corner now. And we're doing it the same way we did the other one. A square of tape positioned so that roughly the middle of the square is uh, where the vertex of that corner is as we focus. And then I'm going to wrap it around like that. And then you do the little pinch fold, so you have kind of a ridge, like that, like that. And then we're going to fold it down, actually fold it the other way. And then we're going to put a piece of tape over it to hold the flap down, and that secures the corner and makes sure it's light tight. Okay, we're going to do the same thing to the other two corners of this ridge. Okay, and so here's the finished uh, slip cover, not finished, but taped up. So I've also taped up the little joints where the cardboard's glued together here and also along this edge where the cardboard is glued, the slip cover is glued together, but it slips on and off. I have the, all the four corners of the uh, box slip cover secured uh, for light tightness. All the joints are secured. So now I'm ready to work on putting and building a pinhole and putting a hole in here and mounting the pinhole into it. Okay, so it's a multi-step process uh, for uh, making these pinholes. So the, we're going to start with a thin piece of 2 mil thick, that's 0.02 inch thick sheet brass against a soft piece of cardboard using our sewing needle. And we're going to simultaneously press a little bit and rotate the needle. And we're going to try to make a little dimple in the brass against the soft surface. So the dimple is going to represent where the brass is going to be thinner than it would be otherwise. And then you'll have a little dimple with a thin little tip on it. The dome of the dimple is is thinner than the two mil uh, of the rest of the brass. Then we're going to rub it uh, dimple side down. We're going to, in a kind of a figure eight pattern, we're going to sand it against really fine emery paper. I have 600 grit emery. And we're going to try to sand off most of the dimple, leaving a really microscopic hole in there. We're going to clean the hole very, very carefully if we need to uh, with the tip of the needle just to clean out any of the burrs so that the pinhole is as clean as it can be. And then we have to measure the size of the pinhole so we know how big it is. I'll show you how to do that. Okay, so I have a little piece of cardboard and I have my piece of brass I've cut out and my little sewing needle on a cork. Um, so there's a natural curl to the brass because it's been in a roll so I try to uh, use the curl to my advantage. So I'm going to make the, the convex side of the curl to be the dimple side. So I'm going to put it face down and approximately in the middle of the piece of brass I'm just going to push a little bit and turn until I have a little dimple pushed in it and even a little hole in the back. Okay, and so here is the dimple side. You might be able to see there's side lighting with some light here, but there is my little dimple sticking up. It's probably broken through barely. So I'm going to take my piece of emery paper and I'm going to start sanding it now and very gingerly dimple side down using figure eight motions. So you might be thinking at this point, hey, wait a minute, Joe, how can you be starting to make your pinhole if you don't know what size of pinhole you need? Well, first of all, you got to know the focal length of your camera. And for my purposes, the focal length measures from the inside surface of the back of the box to the inside surface of the lid where the pinhole is going to be mounted. And according to my measurements, it's about 47 millimeters. So. At this point, you can turn to the trusty internet, and there are a variety of pinhole calculators. Uh, this is MrPinhole.com, uh, just one I pulled up. And it calls for a diameter of 0.289 inches if you're going to be using a 47 millimeter focal length. So I've got to say at this point that the 
size of your pinhole diameter is not as important as you might think it is from reading comments on internet discussion forums. And several reasons for that. First of all, 0.289 millimeters, it, if you think it's exactly necessary to have that precise size, first of all, you're building uh, a camera by hand and you're making a pinhole by hand with a sewing needle and some fine sandpaper, you're not going to get exactly 0.289 millimeters. You're going to get somewhere in the ballpark. Secondly, if you look at the design of our camera, okay, the film plane in the back of the camera, the pinhole up front, you have a really wide film format and the distance from the pinhole to the center of the film plane is short but the distance from the pinhole to the edge of the the corner let's say of the uh, uh, of the image is going to be a lot longer and so you don't you're only optimizing the length of the pinhole for maybe the center of the image or rough the middle image part of the image circle you're not going to be able to have an optimal size pinhole for every part of the image when you're looking at ultra wide angle pinhole cameras because it varies right so again don't obsess over the size of the pinhole just get it round and very smooth and regular and now we get to that ever important question of how do you measure the diameter of your pinhole. Well, there's a various ways of going about it, very high-tech ways and low-tech ways. So my method of measuring uh, the pinhole is really using a loop, a magnifying loop, and a metric straight edge, a metric ruler, if you will, a straight edge. My little protractor here has a metric scale. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to view my straight edge under high magnification, you're going to see each one of the millimeter lines is going to be thick. It won't be a tiny little mark the way it looks to you now. When you look under high magnification, they're very wide. And I'm going to place the pinhole, uh, the piece of brass behind the plate so that half of the pinhole, a semicircle, is showing along the edge there. And I'm going to count how many diameters of the pinhole will fit within one millimeter. So uh, the way this works, is um, our target size is 0.289 millimeters, okay? So I'm gonna go 0.289 and I'm gonna take the inverse of that, which is on this calculator is divide equal equal. So 3.46, what this means is that I should have about three and a half diameters should fit within one millimeter in order to get the right size pinhole and by three and a half diameters, what I mean it would be starting from the left edge of the first millimeter mark, I should have one, two, three, and about a half. Three and a half diameters should fit within one millimeter, and that would be roughly 0.289 millimeters. So that's how I measure it. So in practice, I have to backlight. I have some light behind me here. I have to backlight it. In practice, what I do is I hold the piece of brass up so that the pinhole is right above the millimeter marks like this. And then I take my loop, and I'm using it backwards, and I, magnet, and I focus on it, and I count it, and we're actually almost too big already. So let's count it real exactly. One, two, it's really about two and a half. So I've already made the hole too big. I'm only about two and a half millimeters, and what diameter is two and a half millimeters. Well, I just go 2.5 and I take the inverse of it and that's about 0.4 millimeters. So I'm at 0.4 millimeters instead of 0 0.3, 0 0.289 that I need to be. Is that going to be a problem? Well, it might be if you're a stickler for sharpness, but keep in mind that these, with this box camera, the focal length from the center of the paper is going to be you know, 47 millimeters, but to the edge, it's going to be much larger. So having a 0.4 millimeter pinhole is actually not that bad. One thing I do want to do, however, is I want to make sure that my pinhole is really round, like really round. And also, you want to look at it slightly off axis in all the different directions and make sure there's no burrs. You don't want metal burrs. Burrs, little shavings of metal that interfere because that will cause the image to be very poor quality. And if you do have little burrs, what I recommend you to do is to very gingerly 
put the needle into the hole and just rotate it real carefully. Don't even push hardly, hardly any pressure at all. You don't want to make the hole any bigger. You're just trying to clean up the hole. So there's no burrs, nice and even round. That looks pretty darn good, actually. That's a really nice uniform pinhole. So I have about 0.4 millimeter pinhole, a little bit larger than I wanted. I could go back, cut another piece of brass, and then try to make a smaller hole, but I'm going to be using this one. Uh, one advantage of using a larger size pinhole is that you're going to have shorter exposure times because your focal ratio will be smaller. And if you're using actual film, you're going to have less problems with reciprocity failure, which means you won't have to extend the exposure time as long. Of course, we're using photo paper for this camera, so that's not an issue. But anyways, having a slightly softer or bigger pinhole than you actually need is sometimes okay. That's okay. You can get away with it. So we're going to go ahead and use the 0.4 millimeter pinhole and uh, go from there. And if you take our 47 millimeter focal length, that's to the center of the paper, divide it by the 0.4, we're going to get an F, approximately F118 for a focal ratio of the camera to the center of the camera of the film plane. Okay, so I'm going to be uh, beginning to cut a kind of a square hole into the center of the uh, lid where the pinhole is going to be located. And I've marked the center of the lid just by running the two diagonals and marking the center area of the pencil. I'm going to take an X-Acto type knife, razor knife, and I'm going to cut myself a little square or rectangular hole in there and then we'll mount the pinhole to the inside of the lid. Okay, there is our little hole that we've cut. It's not exactly perfectly square. It doesn't need to be. It just needs to be big enough so that the pinhole won't vignette the image, or I should say the thickness of the cardboard lid won't vignette the image at the extreme sides of the image. And how can you tell that? Well, you're just gonna have to do some careful viewing uh, from where the pinhole would be up to the corners of your box to see if you can you see the corner of your box from those severe angles if you can if you can see the inside corners then you should not be vignetting the image it all depends on how thick the cardboard is right but anyway it looks like this is roughly a little over a quarter inch maybe five sixteenths square almost three eighths square for my applications okay so i'm going to tape the pinhole to the inside of the lid so what i'm going to actually do right here is i'm going to cut down my pinhole brass to a size of around a half inch or so or maybe even a little bit less here is my little piece of brass which is not in focus i know okay so i'm going to take a piece of gaffer's tape a square of gaffer's tape or maybe a rectangle just a snip i'm going to fold it in half so the glue side is out and then I'm going to, along that folded edge in the middle, I'm going to make two 45 degree snips. You're going to make a diamond shaped hole. And then what you do, I'm going to hold the tape up and stick the hole right over the hole in the tape, right over my pinhole. So this is the piece of brass on the back side of the tape. And on the front side of the tape, I have the pinhole there and hopefully my little snippet of tape is big enough that it's not going to obscure the image. And then I'm going to take the box lid and I'm going to put the pinhole on the inside so that it I can see from the outside the hole is centered in my opening. And because I'm using gaffer's tape, which is light tight, okay, here's my gaffer's tape on the inside of the lid. I'm going to try to press it down nicely so the piece of brass is stuck. And I can see my pinhole very clearly. And on the other side, this is what it looks like. You have a piece of brass exposed. Now, for those of you that are sticklers for precision, um, you'll notice that the cross section of my cardboard lid is white colored. And in super bright summer daylight here in New Mexico, I might get some sun flare 
reflecting off the inside wall of that uh, cardboard into the pinhole. So it might be a good idea to take a black Sharpie marker pen or some black ink pen and darken the uh, side walls of that cardboard just so it doesn't uh, cause any problems in the bright summer months. Okay, so about the only other thing I need to do on the inside of the camera is I put a little rectangle of gaffer's tape in the very center of the back of the camera where the paper is going to go. And the reason why I have that is, if you may remember, I have this insert that actually pulls out that helps me load and unload the paper easier. But I want to perhaps secure the back of the paper with a little loop of artist tape. Artist tape is similar to, uh, to masking tape, but it doesn't stick as badly to paper. You can pull it off on the back side of the photo paper and it won't tear the photo paper, hopefully. So what you want to do is you're going to want to make a little loop of artist tape uh, when you load up your paper negative. And the reason why I have the gaffer's tape here is so that this gives the artist tape something to stick against and repeated pulling it off it might rip the cardboard of the camera so putting it against the gaffer's tape it just protects the camera the camera's surface so that gets into the question of what is my film format like well i haven't actually measured it until now and it appears to be five and a half inches wide by two and a half inches tall. And given that the film format is two and a half by five and a half inches, I usually uh, cut my photo paper down from an eight by 10 inch size. So you're gonna have basically five pieces of paper you can cut from one eight by 10 inch size with a little bit of waste here, which of course I always save and use for something else. So I have my camera almost done and all I really need is a shutter mechanism now now sometimes simplicity is a mother of invention. <clears throat> so I was planning on having some kind of a fancy little uh, sliding cardboard thing made of uh, several layers of cardboard with holes in them and a little sliding shutter, but I discovered that, hey, if I operate the camera with the lid in the up position like this on its base, then all I need is a piece of a cardboard that fits snugly inside the lid like that to serve as the shutter, right? Boom, there's your shutter. And so I've cut a little oversized hole in the outer sleeve of this box and I'm using a piece of this chipboard cardboard. Uh, it's not black colored, but also it's opaque, even the way it is. I could if I chose to, I could paint it or whatever, but it just slips in here like that. I just happen to have a spare piece that fits snugly between the two end caps. So this is pretty much a done camera. Um, I could go out and test it. Uh, so you might be wondering, well, how are you going to mount this camera? Are you going to just going to put it on the ground and wedge some rocks underneath it or whatever? Well, you know, you can do that. You can do uh, various uh, ad hoc kinds of camera uh, support methods when you're sitting it on the ground, but uh, well, I built a number of these different kinds of camera bases over the years, different sizes based on what kind of camera they are. This one is just mounted to my little homemade tabletop tripod, so let me remove it and uh, show you. So a scrap piece of wood, nothing fancy, this is just a dinged up old piece of wood, and the principal thing is you use an elastic band of some kind, either a bungee cord or some rubber bands, a couple cup hooks screwed into the sides. Ideally, we might want to put two more cup hooks on the other side so we can run the rubber bands uh, crosswise front to back instead of just sideways. But the main feature is you have a blind nut, a quarter 20 blind nut installed in there so that you have the flush on the bottom for the tripod head to mount to. The camera mounts right on top of the box like this and an elast elastic band or a short, small bungee cord, which is what I'll be using, and there it is. I can just mount this right up to my little tabletop tripod or even a full-size tripod, and I'll be able to uh, go out and take pictures with it. I'm going to go and make a test exposure with this camera now. Um, I was thinking of using paper negatives, but then I got to thinking, well, you know, I still have some Harman direct positive paper, and I could do a Harman picture and have a direct positive after development. Okay, so I'm going to set my a new pinhole camera outside in the front of my house, sunny, lit. It's a cold day, but it's sunny. I'm going to rate the speed of my uh, Harman direct positive paper about four. Now, I typically give it more of a reading in the summertime, a, a higher ISO because there's more UV light in the summertime than there is in the winter. Sun angles lower in the northern hemisphere. 
This is the dark of January, even though it's bright outside, but it's not as bright as summer. So I'm going to give it an ISO of about four, just from my own experience. I've metered the scene already, and it suggests um, for the f-stop that we're using, uh, well, for f90, which is the highest f-stop the meter reads, it's eight seconds. But we have to convert the meter reading to f 118, which is the actual f-stop of my uh, camera. So there is an approximate way of doing it. It's not entirely accurate all the time, but basically it is the f-stop of your camera divided by the f-stop you're metering at, which is 118 divided by 90. Square that, and that conversion factor you multiply by the uh, the meter was suggested reading at f90, which in this case, eight seconds goes to one to 14 seconds. So the working f-stop uh, of f 118 will give me a 14 second exposure theoretically. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to uh, do a 14 second exposure and see what we get. Well, okay, so here's my tripod and I have the camera set up angling slightly up at the front of the house. So I should get some of the this in the upper right. I should get a little bit of this shrub in the foreground and a little bit of the tree in the upper left. And we'll see what we get. Just a nondescript sunny scene. So 14 seconds. I'm going to just make it 15 seconds and uh, do that exposure here. And I'm done with my exposure. I'm going to take the paper negative or the direct positive paper inside and develop it in a little tank. Okay, so I'm going to be rotary processing the piece of Harman direct positive paper in this 35 millimeter developing canister. I'm going to put the strip of paper along the inside wall of the canister facing emulsion side in. I'll put a couple loops of masking tape, painter's masking tape on the back side of the paper so it doesn't fall uh, free of the wall, but I'm going to basically be rotary processing it with only about a hundred milliliters of chemicals So it's only going to come up to maybe about here in the canister and I'll be just spinning it rotating it continuously on this homemade roller base and I have my chemicals all set there and so I'm going to go ahead and go in the dark room and uh, Get it loaded in there and start processing <music> Okay, I got done processing it. I had to move back into the office here because my wife was out in the kitchen. And anyways, so here we go. Still wet from the initial rinse water, but hey, let's uh, let's focus on that. And there we have it. Our first little test from our new camera. I don't know if there's any. Vignetting? I don't think so. Maybe along this side a little bit, perhaps. So anyways, actually, I kind of like it. I really do. Um, so I gave it 15 seconds exposure time, according to our metering, which said about 13 seconds. So it's pretty close. The calculation was pretty good. Uh, one thing about this Harman Direct Positive Paper, you're going to want to use Fresh Developer. Now, I was using a dilution of about 1 plus 15, so that's about 6.5 milliliters of concentrated Ilford multi-grade developer into, enough, into 100 milliliters of water. And uh, it's a one-shot thing. You can save that and use it again for paper negatives, but the Harman itself, the direct positive, kind of uses up the chemistry faster, I guess, during the reversal process. So it's a good idea to mix up a fresh shot every time you do this. And because I'm using the little rotary tank and it uses only, like I say, 100 milliliters at a time, it's pretty economical uh, use overall. So there it is, our little camera, pinhole camera project. We went from a carton, a box that was going to be thrown away, to a pinhole camera and a neat little black and white image, all in a couple hours or so or less. So, this is Joe Van Cleve encouraging you guys to consider doing pinhole photography, especially in these dark winter months when you might not want to otherwise get out. Go out and make some images of the light, and until next time, you have yourselves a great day.